welcome to another exciting episode of Hashtag Real Estate. We have explored offshore property to tax and student accommodation to indirect property investing. This week, we explore some of the viewer questions. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome to another episode of Hashtag Real Estate. I'm Sume Zake. For this episode, we've taken the liberty of looking at some of the questions that you, the viewer, have sent through to the team. And joining us in studio to help us tackle some of those are Chantelle Gladden-Wood. She is partner at Schindler's Attorneys, Conveyances and Notaries, as well as Harry Mayberg. He is director at Itchels and Young. Welcome to the both of you. Thank so you. Um, as I've said, we're going to um, tackle some of the viewer questions that have um, been coming in. And I must tell you, they're quite, they're quite a few. Very broad, but we'll have, perhaps help um, narrow them down. But um, just going through them very briefly, one gets the sense that the overriding um, question here is how does one get started? Where do they start when they're looking at getting into the property game? Your opinion? Well, I think you need to know what your budget is because you might need to get additional finance and that's one of the very big and difficult things to do if you're going to be investing in property in South Africa, depending on, on what you have, what resources you have available to you. And then I also think that you need to know what area you want to invest in. To me, those are the two biggest things that you need to narrow down before you can start looking at particular properties. When you say area? Well, every area has a different, uh, what would you call it, Harry, a different... Um, Profile, profile then, yeah. yes, and you might find that, for example, properties in Santon cost a lot more than properties in the outlying areas, and again, that comes back to your budget. So one of the really good things to do is to partner with an estate agent, someone that you trust, someone who can introduce you to the right properties, and someone who can help you find exactly what you're looking for. Mm. Okay. And I think yeah, just to, to um, add on to what Chantal was saying as well, is uh, the first thing is what is your plan? What is your goal? What do you want to achieve with this? Because that determines, am I just going to buy one or two properties in my own personal name? Or am I going to set up a company? Trust is a little bit out of uh, favor at the moment to, to, to start this portfolio. And also, like anything, you, know, you, you do need money. You need some of your own capital. And of course, the more you've got, the more you can, you can borrow. The less you've got, the less you can borrow. So, mm. so those are added to what Chantal was saying, I think, is the, is the place to start. Know what you want to do, know where you want to do it, and what type of properties you want to buy. Mm. In relation to that, what are some of the common mistakes that um, you have seen um, when you've got these first-time property investors? I think definitely um, over overcapitalizing in terms of what they can afford. Um, it's a highly unlikely, unless you're really hitting um, uh, some very good properties, that from day one, the property rental is going to cover the bond and your other costs. Because even in terms of purchasing, as I'm sure you guys have discussed in the past, there are additional costs in terms of transfer fees and duties. So overcapitalizing and that your bond is not covering, or your, your rental isn't covering your bond at the very least, and then you have to fund that property out of your salary or other income. And that is the first mistake that people make. Mm -hmm. So you need to make sure that you provide for that. Chantal? I think another problem that people often come across is that they don't anticipate how long or how difficult it's going to be in order to get the necessary approvals for the development of the property. So in particular rezoning or the approval of building plans, there are also environmental considerations. Sometimes you need permits and authorizations and it can literally take years to get these. And sometimes you don't even get them at all. It depends on what the decision of the regulator is at the end of the day. So coupled with uh, what Harry's spoken about in terms of what is your idea, what is your end goal, you need to make sure before you actually spend money in purchasing a property and developing it, that you are able to get the necessary development approvals that you need in that particular area before you start throwing good money after bad. Yeah. Is th having the end goal in mind um, such a big determining factor? Because often people um, would make the assumption, I'll buy one or two and decide how I'm going to proceed um, from there on. Do, do, you, do you find that? No, I think uh, that is often the way that, that people get into it. You don't have to have the entire plan mapped out before you start. Often a good opportunity presented and you know, if you just know your, the, the area you're in, you'll know that's a good deal. 
uh, you know, potentially there's already a tenant in place, it's a friend of yours who's offloading it or whatever. So uh, that is, is, is a very good way and probably most people start that way, almost by accident. And then yeah. uh, the so, bug bites them. Yeah. So very soon after that you, you actually have to put a p plan in place Correct. Um, to, 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 to go forward. All right, let's hit pause in the conversation um, for now. We're going to take a quick break, do stay with us, we'll take your questions afterwards. Hello and welcome back to Hashtag Real Estate. This week we're taking a look at the questions that you've been sending through to the team about property and getting into the property game. Our email will appear on the screen, that is um, realestate at bdtv.co.za. So do feel free to share your thoughts and uh, more questions and we'll see how we can tackle those. So our first email comes from um, Simpiwe Matlangu. He says he's a director of a company based in Middleburg, Mpumalanga, and he's come across a viable business opportunity to buy property. Um, the owner there willing to sell that um, luckily, the property currently has two long-term um, clients, being Capitec and a security company. The property is a three-floor um, and can be converted into offices and residential flats. Um, his issue is that he's saying that due to a lack of adequate finance, he's unable to buy the property outright. And now he's approached various funding institutions, but has had no luck. So what he's looking for is um, advice on how to approach the issue. I, I guess, um, broadly speaking, it's actually a, fi a funding issue. Chantal, your, your, your take on um, CMPO's questions. Well, just to reiterate exactly what Harry said earlier, you do need to have some sort of resources to draw down on because if you don't, you are going to find it very difficult to get into the property game because property is expensive. However, for this particular person, an option might be if the seller is willing, instead of concluding an outright sale of the entire property where the whole purchase price is payable up front, it might be viable for them to negotiate an installment sale agreement. So basically what happens is it's very similar to uh, an out, outright sale, except that, and it does get registered at the deeds office so that it is pr both the, the purchaser and the seller are protected, but you pay in installments over a number of years and when the last installment is paid, then the property is finally transferred to the purchaser. That might be an option for this person. All right. Yeah, I think, you know, um, some people probably has gone to his own bank and discussed with them and which is why he probably looks needs to look at more non-traditional options here. And I think what Chantal said is one of those options. You know, the next obvious one, it, it's obviously quite a big building if it's three floors and has the likes of Capitec as tenants, which is obviously a great thing in terms of there's some security of rentals. He needs to maybe find a, a partner who's, who's got um, some capital and funding and, and just look around. And you know, there are other options. Government through the uh, DTI, Department of Trade and Industry, do have various um, sub structures such as the National Empowerment Fund that would look at assisting uh, empowerment deals basically uh, uh, and I'm sure some people would, would qualify for that. So those are the kind of non-traditional routes I think that you can look at when the traditional banks uh, um, you know, are unwilling to or unable to to fund the purchase of a property like that. Mm. Well, I suppose I, I would find it interesting, the point that you made that um, you've got the likes of a, a, a Capitec, so in terms of um, security of um, rental um, income, that the, the bank might not look at that um, um, purchase as a favorable transaction. Um, is, is there anything that he can do um, on his side? Maybe it's a, it's a presentation um, issue. Absolutely, so I think it goes back to the business plan that he's gonna present to the, to the bank as well. Uh, you know, the banks generally, and it depends, each bank is slightly different in their criteria, uh, um, don't take all of the rental income uh, into account uh, in terms of funding their bond, because they, they'll always look at the worst case scenario, and they say if Capitec, for whatever admin really, glitch, yeah. doesn't pay the rent, then some period must be able to, to cover that rent uh, during that period or as well. So that's why they don't always take all of the, the rent into account, but there are obviously certain uh, of circumstances that they do, and especially with the bigger blue chip um, uh, companies. So that business plan, I think, that he's going to pull together is is going to be vital. Yeah, and uh, very quickly, Chantal, installment sale agreements that you that you've highlighted are they a common way of um, reaching alternative agreements with um, such purchases? They're becoming more common in South Africa because not a lot of the population have the resources to enable them to get bonds outright, although obviously there is a growing body of people who can do this. Mm -hmm. So it's becoming a very popular alternative funding method. All right. Okay, let's move on to question two that is coming uh, from Enoch. 
Um, we are a Tanzanian-based mining company with an appetite for huge investment opportunity in the real estate space in South Africa, in particular social housing, student accommodation, and any other low-hanging fruit in the property space, he says. Um, he's thirsty for any help um, getting them started in terms of regulation and registration. So I'm assuming here he's looking to register a, a company that is property-focused. What's your take? The regulation that will apply particularly to student housing depends on the area that you're in. So Harry and I were having a, a very interesting discussion earlier about um, Monash because you do a lot of work with yeah. them. And Monash, for example, as any other university, will have unique uh, student accommodation requirements for that university. So it depends whether you partner with that university directly, in which case you've got to comply with their requirements or whether you take a more general approach, you look for a property that's located in an area where there might be a lot of students, for example, Johannesburg CBD, where there are a number of different uh, uh, universities, and then you would have to have your own selection criteria for your tenants, and you may even want to register with some of the large loan institutions like the, the NFAS, but it really depends on the area uh, to which you're supplying. Mm. In addition to that, uh, you know, Enoch is, is one of those guys that many of uh, South Africans are looking for. He's still obviously a big mine. They've got the cash, but they don't have the know-how. So his first thing, I think, is to find a partner, either a property developer partner or, or team up with, with an estate agent who's working with other developers uh, to, pr to look at those opportunities. Mm. Uh, you know, the lowing fruit, uh, unfortunately, everyone is after that, so there's yeah. quite a lot of competition. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but he needs to find somebody who understands the local market, yeah. Mm. Right, moving on to um, question three from Tobeko Martin. Uh, he says he's recently bought a flat and he's renting that out. I was just wondering if the tenant is not paying the rent, what actions are taken in order to solve the issue? It's a common problem with people who are investing in property. Yeah, for sure. Um, the first th bit of advice I would give before one runs all the legal routes is to find out why is the rent not being paid. Uh, quite often, uh, you know, there may be the answer in, 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 that, in that question. And he'd say he definitely needs to engage uh, in dialogue with the tenant to advise the tenant that it's one of his fundamental rights as a landlord in terms of the Rental Housing Act to receive his rent and then to, to take things from there. If uh, the tenant genuinely can't afford it, they need to come to an arrangement to perhaps sign an acknowledgement of debt and to arrange for the tenant to, to vacate the property as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. Because most certainly, a tenant not paying the rent is an investor's third biggest problem. The second biggest is damage caused by tenants to the property and the biggest is damage and not moving out. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But also, I think um, one of the, the things that um, Tobacco needs to consider is, is the current economic cycle that we're going through does put pressure on disposable exactly. income, and that can have a knock-on effect, which sometimes is an experience through um, tenants not paying, right? Well, one of the things you should be doing, and this is way before you get to the point where your tenant can't afford the rent, is making sure that when you take a tenant on, you check that they are able to afford it with a little bit of flexibility in their budget, should the economy uh, deteriorate a bit. So that the average rule is that you don't take on a tenant if the rent is more than a third of their income. And that builds in a little bit of flexibility in case things get worse. So that's a good idea is to vet your tenants properly before you let them into the property in the first place. Mm. So a lot of hard work that goes into yeah. vetting um, tenants in particular. Yeah. All right. Um, we're going to hit pause on the conversation for now. Do join us after the break where we'll continue in these discussions. Right, welcome back to Hashtag Real Estate. Um, with me in studio is Chantal um, Gladwin Wood. She is a partner at Schindler's Attorneys, Conveyances and Notaries. We're also joined by Harry Maber, who is the director at Etchells and Young. And we're taking a look at uh, some of the questions that you have been sending through, having various discussions about how you um, get started to begin with, um, which is one of the, the big issues for property investors. But right now, we're going to take a look at an email from Mlungesi Simelani. He says he and his wife are passionate about real estate. That's good to hear, uh, to an extent where they have registered a company and uh, they're determined to get more details on um, investing in property. They say they're not registered with the RAAB and are interested in knowing all the requirements in order for them to be fully registered and recognized. That includes, I suppose, looking at training and being um, admitted, as well as uh, not quite sure what he's saying by saying um, 
getting help from government to the private sector. I think that's what he's um, trying to, to, to get at. So basically looking for assistance from um, government and the private sector and as far as investing in, in property. Uh, would, you, would you like to, to, to tackle that one? Yeah, I think, I think his question is probably about um, registering an estate agency business. And that would be the EAAB, not the uh, RAB. So the EAB is the Estate Agency Affairs Board. And all the requirements are most certainly listed on their website, which is eab.org.za. Um, but uh, firstly, uh, all the directors of that company would need to be principal estate agents. And typically, you need to go through 12 months of internship before you, be, you can become a full status agent and then write additional exams to become a principal. But with the new you know, property sector charter, there is most definitely a, a requirement for transformation in the industry and I'm sure that he can get a lot of help either from the EAAB directly as well as um, other estate agency businesses who would welcome a training and a mentorship program to get them on the road. Mm. Is it not difficult though to become a, um, a principal? You say 12, 12 months, there are a number of exams that you also need to, to take on? There is uh, quite a lot of work. Uh, you know, a couple of years ago, I think back in 2008 or 9, the industry significantly changed where in the past you only had to write one single exam to become a registered agent and you could then be a principal. Uh, now, um, you know, with the NQF uh, system, it is a lot more difficult. There's a lot of training and work and basically getting industry knowledge, which uh, it definitely needed. So there is a process to go through. Uh, the 12 months you would be an intern agent and you keep a logbook um, to track all of your activities and really get you into the market, then you can become a full status agent. Only after that do you write an additional exam and do an additional NQF5 um, qualification before you can become a principal agent. Mm -hmm. So there is work to be done, that's why I say to partner with somebody would be, would be the right way to go there. All right, okay. Um, moving on to Lesonolo uh, Mofokeng. Um, they say they're interested in investing in property. They'd like to know which is the best way to proceed, uh, whether buying property shares or buying an actual um, property itself. Chantal. I think we have to go back to the first question again of what type of property you're buying. Because in some instances when you buy property, when you buy shares in the company instead of buying the property itself, you don't have to pay a transfer duty, which is one of the major costs when acquiring property but it depends on the nature of the property itself. Um, and there are a lot of other factors to take into account. So it's a very difficult question to answer if we don't have more specifics. Yeah, but sometimes also these things um, kind of complement each other. You know, someone would have um, physical property, but also then um, invest um, in shares. Mm -hmm. Yes, for sure. And there are obviously a number of, of different shares and real estate uh, trust options on the, on the market. Um, but I guess you know the budget that they have available yeah. would be the determining factor. Your your barrier to entry buying shares is obviously a lot lower than property. You know on the downside you have no involvement in the managing or the running of that property, and uh, you're not going to share or you're going to be sharing your your returns with the fund managers. Whereas if you had to buy the property outright yourself, you take all the risk, but you get all the reward. So it goes back to you know what is their aim, what is their goal, and what is the how much money have they got available? Mm. But certainly a very good starting point the the, the share option. Um, investing into um, some of those stocks? For sure, because I think it, it just gets you into the market, it gets you to, to understand a little bit more about, about property. Uh, you know, most of, of, of the shares that you're going to buy in property are going to be commercial or retail operations. There are not many um, residential uh, um, options available, there are. Um, uh, so you've got some companies that, that um, are involved in student accommodation which you can in invest in? Yes, for sure. So but you're right, in, uh, student accommodation has been very uh, fashionable and very rewarding over the last couple of years. So there are op opportunities in that. Okay. Um, Romeo Mtupa says uh, they want the best method of acquiring property belonging to a deceased individual whose surviving relatives are untraceable. Okay, that's a difficult one. Who wants to tackle that one? <laughs> Okay, <laughs> I'll give it a go. <laughs> so whenever a person passes away, by law, the executor of that estate who has to be ap appointed by the master of the high court steps into the shoes of the deceased. So it's not competent for a person to negotiate the purchase of a property from the heirs or from the family, the surviving family of the deceased because they actually don't have any authority to sell or dispose of that property or even to rent it out. So if you're going to, if you, if you locate a particularly attractive property, the first thing to do is speak to the executor because you have to make the deal with that person. 
if there is no executor, because perhaps the family hasn't reported the death in the estate, then you need to go about a very long process of making sure that the estate is actually reported to the master in terms of which an executor will eventually be appointed and then you would have to deal with that individual to buy the property from the deceased estate. And this can take a very, very long time. Sounds like a very, very long process. Yes. Anything to add on that, Harry? No, I think just, uh, you know, we have been involved in a couple of transactions through deceased estates and provided that the executor is there and has the, the required authority to act for the estate, mm -hmm. it, it's a fairly simple uh, process after that. I think he's going to hit snags if uh, you don't get yeah. there. Yeah. All right. Um, next question from Anonymous. Uh, we bought a two-bedroom unit in Pretoria North in 2007 at 400 and 3,000. Today the market value is around 450,000 rand. The townhouse is paid up and not sure if we should keep or sell. However, the idea is to sell and invest in student accommodation, seeing how little the returns will be for this property. Your take on that? Yeah, I think the, the, the first thing that we have to establish is, uh, is that property, are they currently living in the property or they, do they have a tenant in the property? Because that, that makes quite a big difference. If there is already a tenant in the property, um, but they're not getting the, the required rental, and then it, it might be an option to divest that property and to buy something where the returns are going to be higher. But there are obviously costs involved in disposing of property and, and, and buying the new properties every time that you do that. Mm. You know, my advice is if, if the returns are, are reasonable, if they bought the property a number of years back, hopefully the rental is caught up by now with the, the capital cost and then the return should start looking a whole lot better. Mm. So if it's, not, if it's not absolutely necessary to sell the property, then keep it. Get, uh, you know, maybe see if you can get the rent up um, and, and uh, then work on your, your funding for the student accommodation. Mm. Chantal, your thoughts on that? I think just to mirror exactly what Harry has already said, people buy properties often for two different we reasons. The first is because they want to see an increase in the capital value so that they can sell it and make some, ca some cash. And the other reason is because they want to put tenants in it and let the tenants pay down the bond over 20 years so that they have an asset to use at the end of that time period. So it depends again on what their end game was when they entered the market with this particular property. And if you're, a t if you're, if you're an investor going for the long game, I would, exact, I would say keep it and keep renting it out. But if you are more of a speculator where you want to see quick returns, yeah. then if it's not making those returns from 2007 till now is quite a long period of time for it to have um, increased in quite a small value. I would say divest and look at something with a, with a higher risk profile, which will potentially give you higher returns. All right. Good place to leave it. Thank you to the both of you. And that's it for today's episode of Hashtag Real Estate. Thank you um, for joining us. Until next time, from myself and the rest of the team, goodbye.